So I think Cameron, we're gonna start uh, the webinar and get underway. So as I mentioned to all of you who are joining us on the call today, my name is Liz Weaver. I am the co-CEO of the Tamarack Institute, really excited to uh, start the second series of webinars with Cameron Norman, uh, my colleague, um, and I hope friend from uh, Sense uh, Inc. Uh, and you'll hear more about Cameron's work in a moment. And the, the title of the webinar is Imagination and Design. And we'll tell you a little bit more about this as well as we get underway. But we want to begin um, by acknowledging that those of us in Canada and elsewhere are gathering today um, on Indigenous land and that as settlers, uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet and we thank the generations of Indigenous peoples who have taken care of this land. And, you know, in Canada, we are engaged in a reflection process, reflection and engagement process around truth and reconciliation and the calls to action. And land acknowledgement is um, a, a thoughtful response to one of the calls to action. And I want to let you know that I am joining you from the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. And that this land is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. And so um, that's where I'm joining you from in an area now known as Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, I think, uh, Cameron, you're joining us from Takaronto. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, I am. Uh, I see Connor, uh, Connor and I are both from the same areas. We are from the uh, area of the traditional Mississaugas of the Credit, New Credit, uh, Anishinaabe, uh, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. Uh, and it's the, uh, it's the meeting place. So it's, uh, it's a great place to be from. And uh, I'm always grateful to, uh, to those who've you know, looked after our, this land and I'm grateful to be here. Thanks so much, Cameron. Um, so this is our webinar team, really excited both of us to be joining you. Um, I want to just give you a bit of detail about this webinar and then introduce Cameron. Uh, so this is the first webinar in a series of three webinars that we're going to be co-hosting with Cameron Norman, real excited about this. Um, the next webinar, this webinar is on imagination and design, and we're going to be exploring kind of imagination and production in the design helix, as you'll hear about in a few minutes. This one, we're going to look at imagination. In the next one, we're going to spend a bit more time delving into production. And in the final webinar in the series, we're going to invite some folks to share their experiences about weaving design into the work that they're doing and, you know, thinking about how the design helix might be helpful to them. So the next webinar in the series is scheduled for January 12th, 2022, and the focus will be on design, production, and solutions, and we complete the webinar series um, in February, on February 2nd, 2022. And as I mentioned, we're going to look at design solutions in that webinar. So uh, if you haven't signed up for the other two sessions, we hope that you'll so love today that you'll want to sign up and you'll want to get your colleagues uh, signed up as well to the, the next two webinars in the series. I think it's going to be a fabulous series, Cameron. Really excited to um, be joining you for the series. So let me introduce Cameron to everybody on the call. Uh, so I have to read your bio here. So every once in a while I stumble. So I'm going to say that in advance and I apologize in advance. But Cameron is a professional designer, psychologist, evaluator and educator. He's interested in the science and practice of innovation. Sense making, which is, is his, uh, his company, started as a way for Cameron to share his thoughts on innovation, the process of creating, implementing, and evaluating new ideas and putting them out into the world. And it's now blossomed to over 500 posts and multiple learning channels. So uh, those of you who haven't checked out Sensemaking yet, please do check out Sensemaking because there's lots of resources. And in the post-webinar email, we'll uh, include some links to Sensemaking. 
Uh, Cameron, and it sends with a C, not an S. Um, Cameron is the principal and president of Sense Limited, an innovation consultancy that helps organizations to design, develop, and deploy and evaluate innovation in human systems, particularly in the health and social uh, sectors. He's also an adjunct professor at the Dalai Lana School of Public Health in the University of Toronto. So Cameron, anything that we've missed about you? Oh, that is, uh, I really love coffee. So if you've ever noticed anything with that, usually if you ever, whether it's you visit the website or, or go to a newsletter or anything like that, I usually have some sort of coffee theme or, or motif or something like that. I really just do enjoy it. And, uh, great deal. But the other reason is that um, it's not just the actual bean itself or the, uh, you know, the, the, the actual drink. It's about the idea of like, of my best conversations are usually around a cup of coffee and actually I don't have one here but Liz I, I, I'm so happy to be here with you and it's just like when you and I get together it's just like two friends getting together having a great chat over coffee so that's that's maybe something that, that, that people can relate to me. So. <laughs> yeah yeah well it's really good to know I mean uh, pretty soon hopefully we'll be able to meet in person and have coffee together. Ah. Uh, you know, at a at a at a place that would be welcoming of coffee and uh, that shared experience. But I do think, you know, there is something about coffee and conversation, eh? Or conversation and food, or you know, that where we're a little bit more relaxed and we can dive into the conversation a little bit more deeply. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. I, I did know that about you, and I thank you for sharing that. That's uh, yeah. I'm sure that if we were to ask people in the room what was something unique about them, they would uh, many of them would say, "Oh yeah, I like coffee too." <laughs> <laughs> hey, so why don't we invite people to um, uh, to join us in this poll, and maybe Cameron or not Cameron um, Connor. You can bring up the poll for us. Uh, as we were kind of getting ready for this um, call, we identified this piece of research about eight different types of imagination. And so um, thought it would be a really interesting poll to ask people to weigh in on. And the question is, really, which type of innovation or uh, imagination do you uh, use the most? Cameron, where would you land? on these eight uh, different types of it, uh, imagination. You know, it's funny, because I mean, all these ones are just like, you know, th there's just something very warm <laughs> and touching me about the imagination, which I guess is why we're talking about it today. But you know what's funny? I actually tend to think, I, I'm going to say strategic, only because I'm always thinking about how do we take this further? How do we do something with this? Um, so I, I always tend to be like a, a the guy that jumps into action very quickly. So I would say strategic. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with you. I think I would land more on strategic as well in terms of the one that I is a go-to for me, but I have a lot of dreams. Oh. So, and many of them I remember in the morning. So I, and yeah. I can see how the things that I was struggling with, you know, over the last couple of days or, you know, uh, thinking about from a work perspective, those can often appear in my dreams. And, you know, I'm puzzling them, puzzling my way through them. And, you know, what's also very interesting about, I don't know, my dreams, and I'm sure this is true for other people, I can see some people, there's one, at least one other person that uh, <laughs> is in the dream category with me that there, there are dreams that appear regularly, yeah. right? Uh, so it's obvious that that issue that I'm trying to work my way through has become present again for me. And I'm yeah. trying to work my way through that issue again, and I haven't uh, necessarily resolved it. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So we have 34 people who have joined the poll out of the number of people that we have. So we're about 72%. Maybe what we could do is just give you each uh, another minute or so. So the eight kinds of um, imagination, maybe uh, you can take us through them really quickly as we're waiting for the rest of the folks to uh, finish uh, yeah. thinking about them. Sure. So so the thing about imagination is it's really about that 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 ability to let your mind wander a little bit and, and explore things. So you've got that, uh, you know, it can be taking different things that already exist and putting them together. That's the effectuate 
uh, imagination. Um, it's the idea about thinking about what might be like a, as almost like a scientist as a hypothesis. I know I tend to sit a lot like that too. Um, there's also just the idea about really being fantastical about things, imagining a story, imagining a, a character, having some little bit of play. Empathy is almost the idea of imagining yourself sitting in the perspective of somebody else. What, what, what might that be like to be this kind of person or this person or this in this situation? That's the empathy. Strategic, again, is sort of thinking about how you might actually take it through. Something like, like how much you take something and imagine what you might do as a scenario moving forward. The emotional imagination is that's almost like another twist on, on empathy. It's kind of this idea about what would it be like to, you know, like when you start to think about or when you get really upset or really emotional, and you don't want to show it. The part of you that also can really echo that in, in your head. Dreams are really important. I think dreams are incredibly important. They're effectively in a way are conscious and unconscious having a bit of a dance and weaving things together in a way that that might be, you know, because we've all had dreams that some of them make a lot of sense. Some of them are very evocative and some of them are just like, oh, that's really kind of odd. Um, it's, your, it's your brain. It, it's, it's literally chemicals in your brain. It's your unconscious, it's your subconscious, and it's, uh, it's your conscious. It's all kind of coming together to create stories. And then the last one is memory reconstruction, because in some ways, our memories are our imaginations about what happened in the past. And sometimes they're they get a little bit more colorful over time, and, and but sometimes they're also anchoring our, you know, something that happened in the past to to what what might be happening right now. It's kind of so, like that that pivot moment, right? And yeah. and sometimes we remember it in one way, or yeah, we exacerbate it, or we minimize it, right? As a, so, in a memory reconstruction, it can be uh, that. Hey, so uh, we're ending the poll and uh, look at this. Uh, can you see the poll results mm. on your screen? Yeah. Um, I can. Yeah, so it is interesting eh, to, uh, to think about how imagination shows up for us and show up, shows up for folks in the room here. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a mix between one, two, and strategic. So effectuate, yeah. intellectual, and strategic. Uh, and then lagging a little bit behind our, our uh, fantasy, empathy, emotional dreams. Yeah, interesting. Huh. That is interesting. You know, one of the things is that those three are, are among the most um, organized forms of imagination in the idea about trying to put things together as opposed to much more free flowing, which is much more around the idea of, of just sort of drifting. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe it's a bunch of people who are looking to organize things. Probably not a surprise given, given that, but you know, it's, it's always interesting. Um, and the, the truth is just so people know, we're, we use all these things. Sometimes we use a little more, we have preferences for some, and sometimes we we gravitate towards others, but I mean, we're always using all of this stuff. Um, I, I always find dreams fascinating, but I don't remember as many as I used to. And I don't know what, I go through periods of that. So just to use that as an example. Yeah, and it's interesting. I uh, see more and more learning opportunities, weaving together stories, pictures, and poems. I, um, I did a master's program uh, a number of years ago, and we read a lot of poetry during that program. Uh, and it was a way of then leading us into conversation or taking us out of conversation. So poetry, you know, I think it's one of those under realized ways of creating kind of contextual uh, ways of imagining for us, right? And so, yeah. yeah, and you know, one of the other things before we leave this, one of the other things that we do at Temrac often in our workshops is we'll do guided meditation, which mm. is dream-like, right? Where you have people draw this circle and you, you go from the yeah. outside and do concentric circles, inner, 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 and it's actually a way of focusing your thoughts on a particular conversation and so uh, it, it yeah. is interesting to see how you know many of these you're absolutely right show up in different kinds of ways in the work that we do yeah yeah and that you know that's really the the, the the what we're covering today is this idea about imagination and how does it bring into to what it is that we're doing and and it in in so many areas of, of our lives and our work and it's 
it's interesting because imagination is not visible. It's creativity that, that, that is actually the visible part is that I think it's easy to dismiss it. And so it's again, another reason why I'm really glad we're, we're having a chance to chat about that today. Yeah, yeah that's, that's so interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> okay, so, and that actually leads yeah. us into this first question, which is, you know, what is the role of imagination in the process of design? And I think yeah. we're going to spend a few minutes talking uh, for those folks that haven't joined us about the design helix. So, uh, but really with a focus on the imagination driver of the design helix. Yeah, yeah. And you know what, it, it is, um, it's because it's invisible, you know, because it's in, in our heads, but design is really the process of channeling that, that through, is that taking those things that we, we think about and actually channeling them through into doing something. So design is really about making something visible. Um, imagination is also used in art, but art, what, the difference between art and design is design is, has a purpose. It may have multiple purposes and people may disagree on the purposes and how well things fit with purposes, but it does have a purpose. Whereas art may just be more evocative, you know, that, you know, what, what I see and what you see might be quite different in those things. And of course, it's not quite, quite just completely separated, but what imagination does is really give us a chance to see what's different because we don't tend to design things. If everything's working for us, you know, we don't really need to design stuff. It's already, we're always working with design things. Our organizations are designed. Almost everything a human touches is designed when you, know, when you think about it. Um, our neighborhoods are designed, our cities are designed, our communities are designed, and sometimes they're not designed very consciously. Sometimes they're not designed very well but they are all designed. And what imagination does is, is gets us to think a little bit about what else might we do? How might we do this a little bit differently? So really this is one of the lifebloods um, of what design is all about. And really when you wanna make transformations happening, I always th think about one of the best examples of that is to come back to the idea of, of, of different types of imagination. Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream. Now, if you think about that speech, that mobilized people. And what he's talking about is, I have a dream. It's, it doesn't exist. It's in my head. But I'm going to tell you what my dream is. And maybe you have that dream too. Or maybe we can create something together. So what, they, what people did was they wanted to design the kind of society they wanted to live in. It started with that dream about things being something different. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. I was watching a short video yesterday on YouTube and they were, um, there were these two people that were uh, talking about the Imagineers in the Disney uh, uh, world and yeah. just how everything is designed at Disney, right? Even the flaws are designed into the experience. So um, they had imagination <clears throat> to yeah. think about those designs. Yeah. <clears throat> so tell us a little bit about this design helix and imagination. Yeah. So, so the design helix. Some of you who were on some you know, uh, on some of the earlier conversations that we've had in webinars earlier in the year may, may be familiar with this, maybe not. What this is is the design helix is really a framework, and a framework isn't you know is generally just a way to help people think a little bit about something. So the idea about design, what goes into design, and, and many people maybe on the call might be familiar with an idea called design thinking, and effectively what design thinking is is just how can you kind of use some of the, the mental uh, processes tied to design and, and then turn it into something? Because oftentimes people think about, well, you know, I'm, I'm a social worker, I'm not a designer, I'm a policy maker, I'm a, you know, I, I work for the, the government, what, I don't design, but the truth is we're all designers. Not everyone's a professional designer and some of you are. Anyway, what this is, is that what I think is, is kind of fitting with today's topic is that this idea about imagination is. So if you think about the helix, when we think about the helix, we think about Watson and Crick. Now, interestingly, Watson and Crick gets a lot of credit for coming up with DNA, kind of the discovery of DNA. The interesting thing is they didn't discover DNA. What they did is they imagined it as a helix. They had an idea that this is what it was. And what they discovered, interestingly enough, they discovered that their idea was right, but that that is a way of actually discovering things. So it's kind of embedded into this. And so the idea about the, the, the helix is this idea about we need to imagine things. And as I said earlier about what design is, 
and produce things. So take our ideas and turn it into something. And those weave around into a, a set of steps, which, which are, are on, on the screen. So those of you who can see that thing about just perceiving things, you know, doing some exploration, sense making, starting to, to build something and imagine what that might look like, seeing how well it fits, playing around with it a little bit and then putting it out into the world. I mean, that's really what the, what the design helix is all about. It's just simply a way of explaining that and serving as a framework to help people sit and go, what are some of the things that we might need to do? Because it's easy to just jump into, you know, like, like my, my tendency being strategic is, is that one of the tendencies I have, I always have to keep myself in check is I come up with a problem. I'm like, okay, I wanna jump into the solution. And what this does is it gets us to just to pause a little bit and think there are some steps we can go through. They don't all have to take the same amount of time, but we go through each one of these steps and it helps us avoid you know, get, getting some of our ideas, getting those ideas in, organizing them and, and working with them in a way that, that's, that's more helpful rather than just jumping in to, uh, to the next, next thing or getting us stuck and going, well, I got lots of ideas. Well, now what do I do with it? So again, that's really what the, the framework is meant to do is to, to give that stuff. And any design, any initiative that we do has this DNA, if you will, built into it. We always go, go through these steps. Sometimes we don't do them very well. Sometimes we skip them a little bit, but we almost always go through these kinds of steps to create a design that works really well. Yeah, it's really interesting to me. And I think, you know, one of the things that you and I have been chatting about is, you know, how do we, what are the tools, right, that are out there to help yeah. us um, through, you know, the imagination loop or even the production loop, right? So that we're, you know, not, and there's lots of them uh, in, in the broader context of community change, but also in the context of design, right? And I think you know, part of this series is for us to explore them in a bit more detail or uh, to look at them. Hey, so you, yeah. um, as you're thinking about this helix, you've also played a little bit further with it. Yeah, and, and so the idea, particularly when we're dealing with designing, say, social programming, or if we're building community, for example, there's no end. Like the, the design of our communities don't just end and we go, well, that's it, let's just walk away, we've all got it built. It's always dynamic. So the idea behind that is that's another attractive feature about do, doing this as a helix is that in fact, they weave into one another. We have cycles where we're building, we're creating and we're implementing and evaluating and seeing how things work. And then over time, things, you know, we need to either refresh them or add to them or adapt them because things are, are happening. And that's what this, this diagram here just reflects that, that piece to it. Like how many things that we have designed, uh, programs, policies, again, aspects of our community that were great, that were really fit, they function well, but over time, they don't, you know, they don't work. They don't work as well because everything else has changed. So we need to refresh them. So that's, it's just a, a, an idea again, to remind ourselves that, oh yeah, we're not, we're never really done. You know, we go through cycles and then so we're just, we kind of keep going with that. Yeah, I think that that's really important. It's almost though, you know, a 2.0 version of this might be that there, we create some off ramps too, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe an off ramp of, we off ramp something that isn't working, but continue in the cycle. I don't know how we would do that visually, but yeah. Yeah, this is something to consider. Very important point though, because the other thing is, is that sometimes I always believe also in, in, in arguing around the fit and function. And sometimes things no longer fit and sometimes it's no longer function. There, there's a time when everything has its time where you're like, yeah, we don't need this anymore. And it needs to off ramp, uh, like you said. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, so let's talk about imagination and creativity, which is something you already kind of referred to earlier on. Um, what are they how do they go together these two kind of related concepts or maybe even connected concepts and then what's the what's why is both imagination and creativity helpful to those who are looking to create change yeah uh, it, it's a, it's an important question and one of the things is so imagination is really that that spark that 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 thing that we start to imagine like those those eight pieces at the beginning is different ways of thinking about something seeing them in our head imagining something that can have like it allows us to play a little bit 
And what's nice about that is it starts to explore possibilities. Like one of the things that I, I always try to remind myself and remind others is that almost every good design, every good thing, whether it's a policy, a program or idea that we've come up with started out looking pretty ridiculous. Like even if you think about something that we see in, in so much work in, in particularly in, in cheap transforming communities, they'd have a backbone organization. If we take something like that, backbone organization, think about that 20 some odd years ago or a little further than that. It's like, you know, you're gonna say something, hey, guess what? We got an organization. It doesn't actually do anything specific, but it helps organize things together. And it, it's its own thing. And you might go, really? That's kind of weird. And now, of course, they're all over the place. We see things. We see organ. We have roles that never happened. So, so it's always important to kind of remember that 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 came from imagination. And the creativity is where it's like I have a dream. I have an idea, and and creativity is part of making that real. But it's also the other reason why it's important for people creating change, particularly when we're looking at things like organizational change or community changes. It's one thing to have, I have an idea and you have an idea, but we need to be able to come together. I need to be able to tell you, Liz, here's, here's what I'm thinking. And you go, oh, that's really interesting. I, I'm thinking something like that too. And creativity is, is that, well, how might we take that and put that into something real? Turn that into something. So that's why it's always important with this. And, and you know, what's unfortunate is, is that I think there's a bit of a myth around some of these things. Like these are often viewed as things like, um, uh, you know, that just, well, it's, it's imaginative and, oh, that's really nice. It, it's, it's for Disney. Disney's, are, Disney's masters of this. But if you think about it, most of us have seen a Disney film. We've probably seen many, many, many Disney films and shows and things like that. The reason is because they're imaginative. And what we want to be able to make sure we do is create organizations that serve people and communities that, that support people. And the only way we do that is by, by hitting people where they are, like, like in the sense of, of in their heart and in their mind, that's with imagination. And the creativity is what, what helps us generate that um, into something real. Yeah, so interesting, eh? It's so interesting that we need both. We need to have the imagination about something different, but then the creativity to kind of figure out what, what, what it will take to get us there, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, they're kind of they're parallel concepts, I think, uh, not yeah. necessarily competing. And and I and I also think, you know, this would be a, a premise that I have is that they don't necessarily always fully have to sit in one person. Like, and that's the reason why you would want to, you know, have multiple voices around a table is yeah. it's it's you can really utilize both the imagination and the creativity of folks um, around that table. Cause some of us might lean more, you know, in one perspective of imagination, be strategic in how we think, how we use our imagination. Others of us might be more leaning into stories and that kind of thing. And then others of us have the ability to create, uh, to draw, to, you know, uh, use those skill sets that um, don't necessarily sit with everybody. Yeah, and, you know, and, and Liz, that's a great point. It's so important to think that there isn't, it's not this uniform thing, even if we looked at the beginning as like eight different types of, of imagination. Um, it, there are so many different, different things. Everybody brings it, we all have it. If you look at any child, and that's always the interesting thing, is look at a little kid, they have it. They don't worry so much about sorting, you know, it, it's only as we get older. And really what I often think about is that it, it's about rediscovering things that are already inside us and recognizing that people have got people in roles have got different aptitudes and, and abilities to, to do stuff. And so creativity really comes together when you start to bring people and listening and paying attention to and recognizing that, that I might have a certain kind of a skill set or way of a perspective and you might have something that complements it or even challenges it. But both of those things are really useful. You, know, you bring in someone else and someone else, and all of a sudden you start to see a number of different possibilities, and all of them are, are, are equally important. Not all of them have the, have, everyone's got utility for certain purposes at certain times, but they're all important and, and, and necessary. 
And that leads us into our next um, slide, which is uh, this imagination sundial. Uh, yeah. So I, I, uh, I kind of found this and I know that you're familiar with it, um, but you know, I like, I'm a, uh, I think I should have been in uh, Harry Potter cause I like the <laughs> sorting hat, right? That's my way of doing things, but I, I like this sundial. So maybe you can uh, kind of, Think, help us think through how something like this, a tool or an approach like this might be um, helpful to, you know, groups that are trying to explore that imagination and creativity curve. Yeah, and this really feeds off what we were just talking about is that, I mean, this is a beautiful, like really beautiful and colorful way of articulating how imagination can manifest itself in a variety of different situations and circumstances and how, you know, what I love about this one is also recognizing that, for example, that, that there's space, creating the right space to be able to do that. Like one of the things is, you know, I, I do a lot of facilitation for workshops uh, on this, this kind of topic is, is that you just don't run in and just say, just start creating. Um, because people, you know, you have to create a space to be able to do that. And, and then one of the things that this does is articulate, what does that look like? to be able to do that. Also about place and recognizing that creativity can happen in all kinds of different different spaces and places. And it's a little bit different. It's, and uh, you know, of course now we're, we're all sort of struggling or you know, managing this whole thing about in-person, not in-person, hybrid, that sort of like that. Um, it, and just trying to figure out what does that, because all these things are, are constraints, but they're also enablers. So it, it's, a, it's a case of having a bit of it. And that's what design is all about. Is, is, is really design is about creating within this dance between constraints and enablers. And you're always kind of playing with, you know, what kind of time you got, budget you got, people in the room, all that sort of stuff. Um, the other two things that this is, is it also, also interesting is the practices. I think that's what people tend to gravitate towards the most because it's solid. It's this idea about this. But one of the things I, I like is that, you know, you can do these things around, you know, recognizing things about play, celebration. Like I, there's some really interesting ideas in this. And then the last one is PACs and policies because, again, these are constraints or enablers to be able to, to think about how do we organize ourselves as, you know, with the PACs is in our role. Our, our situation, our, our client, and client I'm using in sort of air quotes, it could be you know, a community, it could be a, an organization, it could be a group that we're in or a group that we're working with. Um, but what, what's really neat is, and this is, and, and then the link is on here and people will have access to this, is it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting because it gets you to start to think a little bit of what my imagination look like in here. And the way you would use something like this is recognizing that you're probably going to use a little bit of each one of these four quadrants at the same time. So you might end up having, you know, talking about permission in a, in a situation of work, working in, in with civil society and, and playing, for example. You might have those things combined uh, together. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting. I love your uh... Your statement, design is a dance between constraints and enablers, right? And I, I, I also like the fact that you, we can think of this sundial as either enablers or constraints, right? Things that we can use to enable something to go forward or things that could be a constraint on the work going forward as well. So yeah, so, yeah. so interesting uh, to think about that. So how do you think... Uh, individuals and organizations can leverage? Um, what can they do to leverage, you know, um, the power of imagination in their work? Because yeah. we're really focused on that part of it. So I think you're right. I think lots of us have this tendency to be doers uh, and not imagineers. And how would we become more imagineering? Yeah. So one of the things that I would say that that's really important here is, is um, you know, and, and, and drawing even some of those lessons from the sundial and frameworks is to get people to think a little bit about taking, first of all, taking imagination seriously. Um, usually it's a fun, like, I, I mean, who doesn't like to think about imagination? I mean, certainly I do. Uh, creativity, it's great fun, but it's actually incredibly serious. Um, one of the reasons why our, 
some of our policies, our programs, our structures and things like that fail is in some ways is a failure of imagination. Is that, you know, and we see this all the time. I mean, so we're right now living through one of the most massive experiments, policy experiments in modern history because, you know, governments, communities, workplaces are constantly having to change their policies because we've got this, this, this nefarious thing called COVID out there. Well, all of a sudden, you know, you see something that gets, gets released and you think, did anybody really... <laughs> Did anybody think that one through? Or is there any really imagination as to how this might go? Well, that's what this is really all about, is to start to think a little bit about what might this look like. So if we're looking to do change making, where this really comes in is in its, its utility is imagination helps us see how we might do something different. And it allows us, it, in some ways it favors enablers over constraints, because there's a real tendency to sit back and go, well, we only have so much money, or we only have a little bit of time, and we only have a certain number of people, so you know, we can't do this. We can't do these sorts of things. Whereas imagination might go, well, are we sure? Like, if we've never done something like this before, how might we? And that's often a question that's used in design, this idea of how might we? Uh, to get people to think a little bit about another way of doing things. Like, what's the purpose behind this? One, one of the analogies that often, you know, is, is held up as a great example of design is, is if you think about things like power tools, most times many of us have these power tools, like put, doing drills and stuff. A lot of people use things like a drill. There's actually research into this. And they're using it for mostly for hanging pictures and stuff. That's a lot of equipment for something that could be done with, like now we have command strips, you know, like we don't need holes or, or a little bit of paint. Like, like it, it gets us to, to ask some of the questions about, well, what's the purpose for this? So when we're trying to create change, this idea about really thinking about imagination starts to sit back and say, well, how might we create something different? And that imagination brings people into the table to say that it's not just what I think, it's what do you think? And how can, we do, how can we start to think things differently and maybe rethink what it was that we were doing? Because again, one of the things also to think about is because so much else is changing, whatever we design for our next, it's gonna be into a community and an economy and a, a social structure that both has elements of things that are the same, but there's also gonna be a bunch of things that are different. You know, and a good, good example of that was hybrid work. I mean, we're not going to go back all 100% to the offices again. We're probably not all going to stay at home either. But there's a, there's a hybrid now. And so, for example, if you're thinking a little bit about recruitment, and I know this just from talking to, to colleagues in different industries, is that all of a sudden it means like, well, we can get great, talented people. But now, you know, many of them are asking, can I work from home? Can I work remotely? Whereas before that was kind of like, well, it'd be kind of nice to do that, but I don't have to. You know, now, you know, before where once you might say, well, where's my desk? Now you might go, really? I've got a desk? <laughs> Some people might, for example. It is, I think you're right. I think there is this uh, shifting of sense that we're all, you know, in right now in this circumstance. But I think the reality is that sands shift all the time and we mm -hmm. go along, you know, this pathway. And so how do we how do we imagine what uh, what possibilities there are ahead of us? Right. And sometimes we do that through strategic planning, but some strategic plans are <laughs> more of the same as opposed to really leaning into that process, which takes yeah. us into this notion of futures and foresight. And so yeah. I know that there are some tools out there, like the Three Horizons tool around um, futures. So maybe you can uh, uh, answer this question or do a little bit of riff on this <laughs> question. I know there are already um, two questions in the Q&A box, which is great. We're okay. going to get to them in a minute or two. Uh, but other people, if you have other questions, put them into the Q&A box and we'll get to them as well, because this is our last question yeah. as part of our conversation. So tell us a little bit about futures and foresight, Cameron. Yeah. 
So what futures and foresight do is they do multiple things. So these, these are sort of like a branch of design um, that really helps us start to focus because we're always designing for the future. Now, whether that might be later on today or tomorrow or, or a year from now, we're always thinking about the future. And, and it's interesting you bring up strategic planning. And, and so one of the, th the uh, traps for some using strategic planning is what we design for is what we already have. And so the idea is, is we come up with a five-year plan, which is again, usually just an arbitrary number, but we come up with a, a five-year plan based on what's happening right now. And we say, well, assuming everything's happening right now, here's, here's what we're gonna do over the next five years. Well, what's interesting is of course now, things are, as you said earlier, is, is the sands are always shifting. Sometimes they're shifting a lot and sometimes they're shifting a little. What futures and foresight start to do is think a little bit about where are we going? Because the best designs are those ones where we meet the future where it, where it is. We, there's no one future, but it's like, how do, we, how do we either shape it, meet it, or both? And what futures and foresight is, is a disciplined way of, of, of using imagination with a little bit of data, like thinking about what is it that we're seeing and coming together to figuring out how we might design for where things are going. It's that old well-worn, you know, beloved Canadian phrase that Wayne Gretzky said is that you want to skate to where the puck is going, not where it is, but he's absolutely right. This is the same thing. It's you want your organization to go where the future is. So in five years, what's that going to look like? So what futures and foresight start to do is look at some trends, trends and, and, and drivers in that. So for example, some work that I've, I've done with, uh, with public health groups right now is one of the things that they're starting to think about is like, for example, what does a post pandemic future look like? And one of the things that they're starting to see is the patterns in chronic disease that have, 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 have continued on up into the pandemic. So many of them have been exacerbated. So the future is going to be a little bit different in terms of how they need to address that, just to use an example. Um, again, if you're thinking about a hybrid work, if you're starting to think about what the future of, of maybe you know, social finance might look like, we're seeing finance things change. All of these different things is what it does is the structured way of, of just bringing together our imagination with some data and saying, if we see where things are going in five years, how might we create a strategy or an organization or a plan that fits that. And then over time, what, what, what Good Futures does is always incorporates a little bit of evaluation with it. As you start to go time, you know, over time, you start to see how close are we to our estimates of what we thought was going to happen. And then we start to make some changes and modifications because, you know, we're never really predicting things, but it's about anticipating what might be coming. And, yeah. and, and that's really the important thing. So we're ready. So it doesn't like, because nobody likes surprises. I mean, occasionally like a, a surprise here and there, uh, you know, maybe when your, your friend you know, comes by with, uh, with coffee or something like that, you aren't expecting. But most of the time, we don't want to have a whole bunch of really big surprises. This is a way of reducing some of that. Hey, so thanks so much. This has been such an interesting conversation as always, Cameron. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, just remind people about the webinar series that's coming up. And now we're going to turn to some of the questions that are sitting in our chat box. And then we have one more poll that we want to do with everybody. So uh, hopefully y'all hang in for the next uh, 12 minutes or so, and then we can get to the poll. So the first question uh, is by Reza. And Reza asks, um, I've been uh, deep diving into the idea of imagination and infrastructure. How do we build infrastructure internally and quotes around infrastructure internally in order to imagine or reimagine or co-imagine it with communities? Oh, what a great question, Reza. That's a, I, I love that one. Um, and I think I've got an answer for you. I don't have the answer, but I have an answer. <laughs> um, so you're thinking about trying to build infrastructure. So one of the things to do that is that imagination thrives with space, like everything. It's this dance between enablers and constraints. If, if, if you just say, you know, take as long as you want, like most times 
most of our creativity comes when we have just the right amount of enablers and just the right amount of constraints. So if we're too constrained, our thinking, it's really difficult to branch out our, our imaginative thinking, you know, they're like muscles, they need to, to work out, but, but you don't want to overtax them. You don't want to just create no constraints, like with just anything. And what we see is actually from the research is that's actually pretty clear is that there's no one way to do it, but, but you need to have like, like deadlines. You know how deadlines sharpen the mind? So most of us, if you think about some of our best work, whatever that is, is tends to do fairly well when we've got a deadline and it's not too close, but it's not too far, and we just somehow manage to. The same thing is true, I think, for imagination. What you're calling imaginative in infrastructure, I think is a great name, is that you wanna make sure that you give your organization and the communities that you're looking to serve some space to come together. That's, that's one of the first things. The other thing is, is that you really need to be able to make it regular. So one of the reasons why children are so good at being imaginative is they do it all the time. And, and the mistakes we make as adults is that we think, okay, well, we're gonna have a retreat and we're gonna be really creative today. And you come together for two hours and everyone's really creative. Great, we're gonna do this again in, in eight months. You need to be able to create space for that. So whether that in some regularity, now that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be everyday practice, uh, maybe it could be, but it's really embed that within your organization and, and the work that you're doing to make it a regular feature. Because particularly as adults, I mean, we're just, we have to reconnect with that. And it's hard because we filled it up with strategic plans and administrative work and other things we've got to do. Oh, spreadsheets. Uh, yeah, spreadsheets and stuff like that. And you can be creative around and imaginative around spreadsheets too. But I mean, the thing is that we, we don't use it to the same degree. So we need to be able to create some space to be able uh, to do that. So I would say um, create space, uh, do it regularly, and, and, and the other piece is also take it seriously. It can be a lot of fun, but it's not just meant to be a creative exercise. It's really meant to be, this is, this is how we share our dreams and visions for what we wanna, wanna create. You know, one uh, interesting thing would be if we could do free drawing on a mural or a Miro board, that would be very cool. I haven't seen that yeah. done yet but that would be the 2.0 of that creative hybrid space, right? Yeah. Reza has yeah. another question, but I'm gonna okay. just jump over that one for now to bring in a couple of questions. So Tracy, okay. uh, COVID caused large systems like governments and post-secondary institutions to consider new ways of doing things. What would be two recommendations that you would have to uh, spark the imagination discussion? Yeah, a, a great question. I mean, really what I would say is some recommendations are, are, are this, is that first of all, convene, bring people together and give them the space to be able to talk about it. So don't overpack your agenda. Uh, Miro is a tool out there. Mural is another one. Jamboard is another things like that. If you're doing things distance, if not, you can always use great old sticky notes, uh, markers, paper, all that kind of stuff. I've used all that stuff and they all work really well. Just get into the practice of being able to be imaginative. The other thing I would also say is don't force it because again, it, it, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable for people to sometimes get there. It's also liberating. So create some space to be able to have people think a little bit about this. But what I would do is, is consider stringing some things together. So have a space where people would say, let's just feel free to come up with some ideas and to think a little bit about this. Like what, you know, how might we come up with some things? And, and, and usually a good way to do it is do things individually, bring them to the table, share them a little bit, work with those things. But those are a couple of things I would really suggest trying to do. There are some other exercises you can do, like you do things around, um, uh, actually, if you go to my, uh, my website, there's a lot of recommendations. Uh, there, I've actually got a number of exercises. I can share some of those things uh, in the post communications as well. Uh, some great exercises that I can actually show you, which you can use that are really good for uh, very simply sparking creativity. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Cameron. I, I, you know, one tool I really like, or one approach I really like, is rather than try to answer a question, just go into inquiry mode, right? So just say, what are the questions that we have about X, Y, Z? 
And it's so interesting. Every time I've used inquiry and just said, okay, now we're going to just keep every, just capture everybody's questions and then start to look at patterns. That yeah. actually is a really cool way and quite, quite simple actually to do, but people are, are, it takes them into another way of thinking. It's a great, that's a great point. Absolutely. Curiosity is, is the mother of imagination. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, so Ian has a question. So Ian's question is, how might we? He starts with, how might we? So we can see that <laughs> Ian has been listening. How might we best prepare our organizations for the power of imagination and teach them of its wonderful power? It feels like many organizations are unprepared or unwilling to create the space for imagination. I think this is there's a thread here. I think people are yeah. really interested in this uh, this kind of conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I would simply say do um, uh, like one of the things we have to do in, in design or design workshops, because I often will emphasize as a principle, show, don't tell. Uh, you can I come up with tons of case studies and show you all kinds of examples about how imaginative thinking has solved problems, uh, the evidence behind it, why, you know, why you should do all these sorts of things. That's all great. Um, but uh, have people do stuff. Because all of a sudden you start to realize that. Like Liz, you were talking about poetry earlier. You get people in front of a poem and all of a sudden you start going, oh yeah, I'm starting to think a little differently, see differently. So do something. So what I would honestly say is just almost like building off the last question is create space to do that. And and be small, be, you know, just even if it's tacking it on at the end of a meeting, give yourself 20 minutes to, to have a little space to do that. Um, I would honestly encourage you to do that because the more people do that, the more they start to see some connections. And then you can always add in case studies and, and examples after that. Yeah, you know, I, um, I'll i just uh, pull up a quick story. I, I was uh, chatting with a colleague who it was American Thanksgiving and this person was uh, reflecting on you know the story about the pilgrims is not actually a, a great story if you think about it um and it's it's there's elements of it that are true but elements that aren't true and uh this person was you know um thinking about okay so how do we talk about what really happened and that kind of thing and i said you know what if you instead of you know entering into the conversation you know with all of whatever you enter into that conversation with, but you did something different, like bring a children's book or, uh, cause there were children at, at that family, um, bring a children's book and try to shape the conversation in a different kind of way. You know, like, I think, I think sometimes we think it's only one modality and yet we can enter into conversations or bring things in in creative ways or imaginative ways that, that can shift you know, how, how we are talking about things. Um, this, uh, I, I don't know if we have enough time, maybe yeah. one minute on this question okay. from our anonymous attendee, but they say, I struggle with the emphasis on data and being able to report outcomes, uh, the need to measure our impact qu uh, quantitatively can limit the design process. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I've got something I'm gonna write a note down so that I can follow it up just because time um, that I've, I've written on, but I will tell you this. So one of the things is, is just make your process your outcome um, and that will help lead to things. So for example, how many ideas did you generate? Um, how much, how many people participated? All of those sorts of things that you can start to do and then to start to map those things on to what it is you actually do. So for example, if you have a process, this is where, again, the design helix can be useful, something like that is, is you go through the steps and say, what do we generate at each one of these things? And all of a sudden you start to actually point to a lot of products in, on, in service of creating certain outcomes. So that's really maybe the, that's the short answer. It's a little bit more, more elaborate than that, but ultimately once you start to do that, you start to realize, oh yeah, the more we do these things, the more we tend to achieve these outcomes over time. What we often forget is we forget the inputs. We for completely forget how much work and effort and energy goes into to generating these great ideas. We just think about the end product. What this does is that good, the good creative thinking like that really allows us to start to figure out what's working, what's not, what we're doing and what we're producing. 
Cameron, there are two more questions, one from Reza and one from Scott. Uh, we'll bring them forward and answer them in the post email. So Reza yeah. and Scott, uh, read your post email. Your responses will be there. And anything else um, that you think of, uh, Cameron will bring into the post email as well. Hey, for those of you that have stayed on, we want to do this um, poll again. But we have a little bit of a different question, just given the fact that we've been in the call together. So, uh, um, Connor, if you can bring up the poll, that would be great. Um, what type of imagination would you like to explore further? So we asked you what type you use more at the beginning, but now we want to know, given what you've uh, what you've uh, heard, what type would you like to explore further? And we'll leave this up for. Uh, it'll be a relatively quick poll. Uh, I can see that there's like a only maybe a minute or so yeah. uh, to get you to respond. Oh, you're much quicker this time, everybody, <laughs> in terms of, of your responses. Uh, I think I still just have one person joining me in the dreams, <laughs> which is great. Great. So we're gonna end the poll. Uh, so you can see uh, we're yeah. So people are, you know, wanting to spend a, a little bit less time in the imag imaginative, but we're still yeah. kind of in certain categories, eh? But a yeah. bit more spread out than the first poll. So thank you for that. Not everybody got the opportunity to share, but certainly lots of you did. So uh, thank you for that. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Any final words, Cameron? Uh, just, just you know, if you want to stoke your imagination, just start practicing right now. Easiest thing, grab a piece of paper and a pen. See, see, where, you're, uh, see where things go from there. Yeah, you know, we should all have those pieces of paper and pens at our desks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or wherever we are. Hey, thanks so yeah. much, everybody. We'll see you, you on January 12th. Take care, everyone. Thanks for everything. Mm -hmm.